Good morning, Service Mesh Con. Welcome to Service Mesh, the new single point of failure. In this talk, we're going to be discussing some of the trade offs that Service Mesh has made on implementation and how that impacts you as users. Uh, I'm here representing Linkerd, Mitch will be representing Istio, and Sabine will be chatting with us about console. Sabine, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Sabine Sayed. I'm joining you here today from my Clovis. Uh, I work at HashiCorp as an engineering manager on the console service mesh. Uh, I have worked at HashiCorp since the beginning of this year. Uh, before that, I have been working in the infrastructure industry uh, for about five or six years. Um, yeah, and I'm super happy to join you all today and have this conversation with Thomas and Mitch. Thanks. That's fantastic. Mitch, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, my name is Mitch Connors, and I'm a software engineer with Google. Uh, I work in Seattle, Washington, and in the last two years, I've been working on the Istio project. In particular, I work in user experience, where I make it my goal to really deeply understand the way that our users interact with Istio, uh, to understand what its strengths are as well as its weaknesses, and then to take those learnings and turn them into meaningful features that users like you can take advantage of in Istio. KubeCon is one of my favorite ways to meet and interact with users, to hear about the creative ways that you're using our software, ways that maybe we would have never anticipated, as well as to understand how we can better serve you in the future. So I look forward to chatting with all of you, to hearing your questions at the end of the session, and to interacting with you in the lobbies. Thanks. And hello, everyone. My name's Thomas Rampelberg. I'm a software engineer here at uh, Buoyant, the creators of Linkerd. Linkerd is a super fast, super lightweight service mesh that's really focused on user experience. Here's a little bit of a agenda for what we're going to be covering today. Uh, I'd like to call it turtles all the way down. Uh, first off, we're going to be talking a little bit about complexity or the power of saying no. Uh, what it takes to go and build your service mesh out in a way that uh, walks the fine line between features and something that uh, isn't particularly usable for folks. Uh, then we will be chatting a little bit about how to operate your service mesh and what that takes. And finally, uh, my perhaps most passionate subject, what to do when the service mesh breaks or how to figure out how to debug and manage your service mesh in production. All right. Complexity, I've never heard of you. Uh, complexity is a big part of service meshes. Obviously, it's something we want to fight against. Since we're talking about a new single point of failure, a uh, complex single point of failure is 10 times worse than a uh, normal single point of failure, though obviously we'd prefer not to have a single point of failure to begin with. Um, to get me to get us started on this one, uh, Mitch, I know this one is uh, subject you're particularly passionate about. Uh, tell us a little bit about how Istio has been managing the complexity. Is there anything you've done recently that uh, you feel has made a really big, uh, big win there? Yeah, you know, as I think about service mesh in general, what it does really well across the board, I think, is it takes complexity out of your application layer, which is great. Your developers don't need to think about all sorts of complex network topologies and problems. Uh, the downside, though, is that we tend to sort of have the consolidation of all of that complexity into one layer that can look very difficult to manage and fragile at times. And so one thing that we learned in Istio is that even though we're developing a product for microservices and we've all got a, a pretty good background in running microservices, it was just too much complexity to have your microservices management platform run microservices itself. Uh, asking our users to run microservices on our behalf, where we're not actually the ones operating these things, we're not even necessarily talking to the people who are operating these things, was just too much complexity. And so uh, a year ago, we moved to a monolithic model for our service mesh, and we've seen substantially reduced friction uh, in terms of upgrade and maintenance for our users as a result of that. It's been a sort of counterintuitive, maybe eyebrow raising move for some, but I think it's been great for our users. The other area that we're always fighting complexity is project sprawl. Uh, and that is we're always hearing from various users, well, we'd love to see a full-fledged Canary feature, or we'd love like a full platform for running software or, and services where we can see all of the knobs in one place in a user interface. We made the very intentional decision not to be a platform. 
Uh, and it's an interesting decision because it means that Istio is not all you need to run your services. We are not a one-stop shop. The intentional decision there is that we want to be part of an ecosystem. We know that we are not going to be the best at everything. So we're going to strive to be the best at a very core set of service mesh features and then allow uh, various other technologies to come in and fill the gaps, such as canarying. There's a number of technologies out there today that are doing a great job with it built on top of service mesh. So those, that's kind of how I think about complexity and how we manage it in Istio. I really love the microservices point. Um, I have a long argument that microservices don't actually solve a technology problem. They solve a people problem. And if you've got uh, microservices solving a people problem where teams get to own their own destiny, uh, the service mesh owned by a single vendor, AKA the Istio team, doesn't really make very much sense as a microservice solution. Um, and it's just, it's fascinating to see how that all fits together. Uh, yeah, that, that's super cool to go and uh, think about there. The um, I love your point, too, about the uh, not being a platform. Um, it's too bad that Kubernetes doesn't come with a service mesh out of the box and a Canary deployment. But I think that uh, especially once we start talking cloud native, there's so many folks that have so many different, interesting, unique use cases that the only way to have a great solution is to make it so that the community can build badass stuff. like. Mm -hmm. Something on the Linkerd side in particular, we don't do ingress and we don't do ingress because there's a bunch of amazing ingress controllers out there. I did a, uh, my KubeCon talk is going to be with the ambassador folks, which is a fantastic solution for us because they're, they're going to do it better than we ever will. You, you know how that works. Um, Sabine, uh, tell me a little bit about console and how, uh, you've been managing the complexity there. Yeah, so um, one of the things kind of piggybacking off of both what you, Thomas and Mitch had said. Um, so one of the pieces that we decided to say no to or that we didn't want to build um, was an APM solution. Mm. So um, we did not want to store metrics in console. Uh, but we also we still wanted our users uh, to be able to visually see uh, their user workflows and metrics uh, in the console UI. So um, what we have built is a scalable JavaScript plugin. Uh, and this JavaScript plugin allows users to query data um, in the APMs that they use. And APMs, uh, just FYI for, for those folks who may not know, is an application performance management uh, tool. Uh, and these are, as an example, there's Prometheus and Datadog. Um, so right now we have a plugin for Prometheus. So our users can use that, um, query that, get data from there. And then we have um, uh, in our console UI, uh, we have a topology view that basically shows the data model and then it supplements it with metrics data coming from that APM. So things like oh. your request per second, latency, error rates. So, so uh, so the dashboard for console can actually pull metrics out of Datadog. Correct. That's yep. super cool. That's super yeah. cool. Yeah. So right now we have um, our first plugin is for Prometheus. And so we can add on other plugins for other APIs. Very cool. So, yeah. yeah, we uh, in Linkerd, we looked at Prometheus and said, everyone in the world is integrating with Prometheus. So we're just going to stick stuff in Prometheus and hope for the best. Uh, yeah. Mitch, this is actually an interesting conversation given Istio's history. Tell us a little bit about where uh, Istio's relationship with uh, Prometheus and where that's gone. So I'm curious where, where you'd like me to go with that one. Are you thinking about Mixer and, and what we've done with that over time? Are you thinking uh, about our default installs with Prometheus and have we removed that from the project? I didn't know that you'd removed Prometheus from the project. That's a new one for me. Yeah, we have. And it's because we love Prometheus. Uh, so it's a little bit of a, a surprising twist. Uh, we found that users already have Prometheus installs and they don't want to fiddle with federation levers in trying to get our Prometheus install to work well with theirs. And they really don't want our Prometheus install to overwrite theirs. Um, so we found that it was best just not to install it and give them clean instructions on how to plug their service mesh into their pre-existing Prometheus install. Mm. But we uh, we are about to release a stable version of Linkerd that comes with our bring your own Prometheus uh, 
solution for a lot of those same reasons. Um, no, I was actually thinking more about the mixer or the demixerification that has happened uh, recently, especially since we were talking about um, complexity. I thought that that was an interesting piece there. But uh, generally speaking, especially as cloud native projects, I think we've all realized that metrics are better served by the community to go back to the theme we're kind of going along there. Yeah. Um, Mixer and, was an interesting architectural change because originally Mixer was one of the key motivations for running Istio as microservices. Uh, Mixer was the only layer that logically could block the data plane. So yeah. it had to run extremely light, extremely fast. And it was because of policy decisions. We also put telemetry there because of the close coupling with the data plane, but that was more incidental. Policy decisions are really the hard part that Mixer was handling. Uh, fortunately, over the last year, the developments in WebAssembly have made it so that those decisions can actually be written in arbitrary code that executes inside of the data plane. So with zero latency in terms of network cost, and that's what enabled us to get rid of Mixer and ultimately move towards monolithic uh, micro, or mon not monolithic microservices, mon monolithic <laughs> service mesh. There we go. Uh, it, and it's super interesting because it's a monolithic service mesh, but with the WASM plugins in Envoy, it's almost like you've got it like the ultimate distributed system. Yeah, I don't think anyone has fully realized the capabilities, including the Istio project, uh, the capabilities of having arbitrary JavaScript script code that just runs ubiquitously in the in your proxy. I am really excited to see the developments that come out of that over the next two years, especially now that WebAssembly has been merged back into the Envoy upstream. I have done horrible, embarrassing things with uh, eBPF that are basically the same. Once you give someone the ability to do anything, the world, their world is their oyster. The hacks I have done, it's, it's yes. unfortunate. It will be a um, wonderful, terrible world, I think. <laughs> uh, Sabine, I think you mentioned you had something else that you wanted to bring up around complexity, too. Yeah, so there's one other thing that um, that we decided not to go forward with. Um, and this was around um, supporting multiple console installations on one Kubernetes cluster. Ah, yes. <laughs> so some users, they... Uh, you know, they might want to have uh, two environments on their k cluster. So, you know, a dev environment and a production environment possibly on the same k cluster. And so that can result in a number of issues like security issues, performance issues. So just like around the security issues, if you have two environments on your k cluster and you have two console installations as well, if there's a console client that you want to uh, register with, for example, your dev environment, but you do it by accident to production, that can cause huge, you know, very obvious uh, security issue there. Um, and then along the same thing, um, that can also cause performance issues where if your dev environment or your staging environment, uh, there's a ton of tests running and all of a sudden it's using a whole bunch of resources. So then that can have an effect on your production environment. So we basically wanted to make sure that users don't run into these issues. And so therefore we decided to limit to uh, one console data center, one console installation on one uh, Kubernetes cluster. So. Yeah, we, uh, we started out supporting multiple uh, Linkerd installs on clusters with this idea that uh, less the like dev prod instance, so that's a really good use case, but more the multi-tenancy, which I think I'm gonna ask Mitch in a second about, cause I'm super excited to hear there. Uh, but we ran it directly into the buzzsaw of CRDs because you can't have CRDs version in any reasonable fashion. Having mm. two installs, especially of Linkerd when you've got a couple CRDs starts to become totally untenable because how do you do the upgrades? How do you keep from stepping on other people's feet? feet? Mm -hmm. um, and so at least on our side of things, we've really been pushing the um, multi-cluster as a way to do isolation and multi-tenancy instead. Mm -hmm. And I will point out that I personally would never operate a dev and prod yeah. Kubernetes cluster <laughs> as one. That That's crazy. Yeah. Um, so Mitch, I'm super excited. Tell us a little bit about Istio and uh, multiple installs on a cluster. Yeah, so multiple installs on a cluster has been something we've been working towards for the last like 15 months or so. It's been kind of early access since 1.5, 1.6 timeframe. But I think it's safe to say that in 1.8, 
the standard way of upgrading Istio actually involves running multiple installs concurrently. Interesting. Uh, because we've consolidated that single point of failure into one resource, the Kubernetes deployment model of updating a deployment and kind of crossing your fingers that health checks fail if something goes wrong, um, <laughs> just wasn't enough security and safety for our users. In particular, when you upgrade a control plane in a service mesh, oftentimes the health failure doesn't happen within the control plane itself. It happens within the proxies. Uh, and mm -hmm. Kubernetes doesn't provide the kind of levers and granularity that we needed to really detect failure early in moving to a control plane. So with revisions, what we mm -hmm. recommend users do, like if you're moving from say 1.7 to 1.8, uh, is you install a separate 1.8 control plane that initially does nothing but serve ingress traffic. Mm -hmm. It's using all the same root of trust, all the same MTLS and everything mm -hmm. else as the other control plane. It's just got almost no proxies connected to it. And then as you're comfortable, you go through and cut your proxies over one namespace at a time until you're finally able to shut down that old revision of Istio. So I don't know that we envision a lot of use cases where people are permanently running multiple mm -hmm. revisions uh, in one cluster, although that is, it's possible. We're just not certain it's useful. Um, but as far as upgrades go, it's been a very beneficial tool and I think has increased the predictability of the upgrade process a good deal. Yeah, the uh, it's super interesting to talk about upgrades in general are like are hard. Uh, I've in the Kubernetes ecosystem in particular, I'm really excited about all of the folks who are working on uh, workflow related projects because especially upgrading a service mesh. To your point, you really need gates, right? It's not just upgrading the control plane; it's also making sure that the uh, proxies are at the right version. And then you know, okay, I can upgrade the control plane this far. But now I need to wait, make sure that the data plane gets rolled before I go do the next steps. And that's and that's a tough, it's a hard problem. Distributed systems I hear are challenging for some yeah. reason. <laughs> yeah, you know, you almost wish that you had a service mesh to run your service mesh on. <laughs> it's turtles <laughs> all the way down. All right, it's super awesome to hear about how we've all been managing complexity in our own service meshes. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about a subject that's near and dear to my heart, um, actually operating the mesh. Did you say someone needs to keep the mesh up? How do you go and tackle actually managing this thing in a cloud native world where there's all kinds of operators and users? Uh, Sabine, tell us a little bit about the console side of things. Yeah, so on the console side, well, specifically around getting started or getting the mesh up and running, there's um, a few things that we do to make that easier. Um, so the first is around automating the ACL setup. So ACLs are basically access control limits. Um, since console exists outside of Kubernetes, it has its own authorization solution. Um, and we basic, so basically ACLs are to console what uh, Kubernetes is to our back. I actually, actually said that the other way. So, um, so yeah, so basically, um, yeah, ACLs are to, to console as uh, Kubernetes uh, is to RBAC. And um, instead of, we had a choice here of, um, we could have let our users uh, create their own ACLs and have to do that manually. Uh, but we wanted to make that piece easier for our users. And we basically have uh, set up a bridge uh, from the K8s RBAC to our console ACLs. Uh, and this is all done automatically uh, so that our users can, they don't have to manually set up anything um, for the ACLs piece uh, and it's all done uh, just automatically. So the, that's really cool. This is something I had, I didn't know anything about. So the, um, you actually have an RBAC bridge. So Kubernetes native RBAC calls get translated into console ACLs. Correct. Yep. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I, I went deep on the uh, GKE uh, RBAC plugin once and was, I'm not going to say horrified, I'm going to say uh, impressed by the uh, effort that the engineers went to. I can only imagine how much uh, that took. But since we're talking yeah. a lot about complexity, it's so important to have a single store, especially for something as important as RBAC. That's really cool that you went to the effort for that. Yeah. All right, I'm going to I'm going to do a little bit about uh, Linkerd here. Um probably one of my favorite things about Linkerd is uh our 
check command. And the reason for that is that uh, Kubernetes clusters, even though we're talking cloud native and uh, cattle instead of pets, I'm, I'm going to say Kubernetes clusters are snowflakes especially once you start talking across organizations. Uh, for example, we just got done talking about the console RBAC to ACL mapping. Who knows how that maps on a cluster where somebody's got installs or not. And so um, mm. we spend a lot of time, uh, if I see two users reporting a difficulty setting up Linkerd, we go create a check for it. And so um, we will go actually do validation before you install your cluster to say that you've got the right RBAC to be able to go and create it. And then we'll do it after you install the cluster. And none of the checks at the moment are, um, uh, I'm going to call them integration tests, e.g. they just go make sure that the readiness is passed, liveness is passed, something like that. Um, though we, we did have a summer code student work on some uh, conformance tests that I'm very, very excited about to actually like test real workloads on Linkerd once you've got the install done. Um, but uh, I did this purely out of laziness because I wanted to be able to give docs links to folks for how to fix their problems once they run into them. And having it all automated into the install flow has been just amazing from our perspective. Um, Mitch, do you want to talk anything about the Istio install flow and kind of some of the cool stuff you've done there? Yeah. Um... You know, something that's interesting about install, we're in a Kubernetes world, and so everything needs to be declarative. Uh, but what we're <laughs> learning, right, is that upgrades are not a declarative operation. No. Um, I don't ever want to declare the entire state of my mesh in the next minor version. Instead, I want to do a mutation, right? I want to say I'm on Istio 1.x. I want to be on Istio 1.x plus 1. Mm -hmm. And that's the only change I want to make. Don't touch all the other knobs and bells and whistles. Um, and so we, we've kind of had to take our time and learn some hard lessons in terms of when we ought to be following declarative semantics and when it's better to do a more mutational semantic. Um, one thing that we've done over the last year to sort of assist with that, it doesn't directly address the problem, but uh, we've introduced analyzers, which it sounds like are a little bit like checks. It's oh, a suite of things. It's not exclusively focused on upgrade or install time. It actually can run during runtime. We bake them both into the control plane as well as into the CLI. You can run analyze and it'll list some probable problems or maybe definite problems that you have related to your configuration. For me, my favorite one, I always fat finger the gateway name when I'm mapping a virtual service to a gateway. I mean, just every time. And the analyzer catches it really well. And I'm excited to say that uh, now there's even a way that you can have the control plane begin writing those analysis messages out into the status field of the objects. So if you run oh. a kubectl get on an object that has a problem with analysis, you should see it right there in your YAML. That's cool. Not enough folks use Kubernetes events. Uh, one of my favorite uh, projects since we talked about Canary earlier was is a flagger. And Stefan goes and puts uh, events in for all of the Canary progress and you see it on the actual resources, it's, it's so use, useful. Um, analyzers are super cool. Uh, we've actually had a bunch of users just take our check command and stick that into their uh, alerting workflow, which drives me crazy because we built check as a like user interface. But man, it's cool that, that folks are doing it that way. Uh, that's, that's really cool. Here we go. So uh, Sabine, uh, we had been chatting a little bit beforehand, and uh, one of the things you said, mentioned was the approach that Console had around federation. It's an interesting feature set that uh, at least we don't have in the Linkerd world. I'm super interested to hear more about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so. So yeah, so one of the things that uh, console does or what we have done is to try and ease the process of federating two data centers or however many uh, data centers you have. Um, so just for the folks who don't know, federation is just data centers being able to communicate with each other. Um, and, and this is setting that process up or setting up um, Federated clusters is hard. Uh, there's a lot of config <laughs> data that's required. Um, and so we have uh, tried and we have simplified this process by giving our operators the ability uh, to get a single secret uh, from their primary 
uh, data center. Uh, and then they can take that secret and do a kubectl apply in their secondary data center, uh, and then Helm install, and they're good to go. And those uh, data centers are federated and uh, up and running and communicating with each other. Oh, that's so, cool. I, like, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm going to poke fun at Istio. I tried to do an early version of the Istio multi-cluster and uh, I'm not, no, I'm just going to say I failed, man. I could not get that sucker set up. <laughs> you didn't fail. We failed. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to say like, this is a pivot that we have to make as a project. We take responsibility for outcomes. We don't just deliver really cool technology that this one time we got running inside of a cluster somewhere. If our users can't do it, it's not done. Um, and that's something we've been focusing on actually with re in regulation to multi-cluster in particular with the 1.8 release, we are finally, and it's not out the door yet, so I'm not, <laughs> this could always change, but we're like a week short of the finish line and we are finally calling multi-cluster beta, meaning we finally oh, cool. have the degree of support that, that where we can say, this is going to stick around and this is the shape that it's going to be in for some time. We have a bit of a feature maturity problem in that we have a bunch of developers who love shipping new features and they're so cool and shiny and they're alpha. And we don't have a lot of developers historically who have focused on doing the very hard productionization work of promoting that feature through to beta and then to generally available. So I think that's gonna be a new focus and theme of the Istio project over the coming year. Oh, that like uh, the it's seriously the unsung heroes too. the person who ships the feature first is always the one who gets the like uh, kudos. <laughs> and then that that poor person who goes and spends years polishing off and making it more stable. Just uh, uh, we in Linkerd, we actually have a program that we call Linkerd Heroes, where that's kind of the opportunity. I love it because I get to call out. Uh, we've got one developer who is uh, like, CI machine and he keeps CI running. And again, like it's not something you see in the change log, but it's the only way that we ship software. It's that's really cool. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to go back to Sabine's point about federation and the multi-cluster stuff, um, it's tough. Like uh, in Linkerd uh, for multi-cluster, we have you pull a secret from one cluster and push it onto another. Mm -hmm. And that's cool, except that it requires kubectl context games and this, that, and the other thing. And like, uh, I wrote the uh, tutorial for our multi-cluster and it's basically crazy bash for loop scripts. And there was nothing I could do about it. It was that or 20 paragraphs to explain how it all fit together. I'm uh, super excited about all the work that SIG multi-cluster has been doing to kind of make our lives a little bit better. I think that's another example of a case where it's hard to optimize for both the demo use case as well as the yes. production like yes. enterprise grade software use case because in an enterprise they have secret management systems that are already in place they already have probably mm -hmm. a managed certificate somewhere in some system whether they're doing it, you know there, there's a hundred different ways to accomplish that uh, but they the last thing they want is my bash script generating a self signed cert and then pushing it to production for them. But I in a so. demo use case, that's absolutely what you should do. It's the right thing. If you want to show off a shiny multi-cluster demo in 15 minutes or less, uh, the way that you get it done is by not productionizing your service mesh. It's a difficult problem. The uh, yeah. We've definitely run into this. Uh, in Linkerd, we ship with uh, Jaeger install out of the box. Jaeger installs are insanely complex to productionize, not because Jaeger's a complex product inherently, but you've got storage as part of it. And so our uh, Helm chart is uh, forcibly minimalized to the point where it feels awkward if you try and put it into production because you you should go and use the Jaeger operator if you want to get that into production for sure. Um, Mitch, is there anything you else you want to kind of say around uh, the kind of cluster operation side of things? No, I think we've covered everything. Before we get into this next section, I want to uh, tell a little bit of an anecdote, which may uh, stick my age as being an old person, but I'm going to say it anyways. Uh, back in the day, whenever something goes wrong, really, there's only one reason it went wrong. It's DNS. It's always DNS's fault. 100% of the time, it's always DNS's fault. And uh, one of the really interesting things that we've seen, at least on the Linkerd side, is that uh, now that you've introduced a data plane with a service mesh, it's not actually DNS's fault. Okay, it is 50% of the time, but the service mesh gets blamed 100% of the time. And so <clears throat> at least for us, 
we've really needed to design for failure and think about what that means, not just for the control plane and operating the service mesh, but what it means for the developers, the user of the service mesh as well. Um, Mitch, I'm sure that you've got some interesting insight from the Istio side to share along those lines. Uh, tell us a little bit. Yeah, that, that makes me think of kind of two stories within the project. You know, historically, I've only been on the Istio project for two years now. And before that, I owned the API on a large enterprise grade network appliance. Uh, and we became the catch all for everything that went wrong with that network appliance. It's like, well, it went wrong after I told the API to do it. And therefore, it's definitely the API's fault. Uh, and it took a while to really embrace that role. But I think what we learned is that that can be done really, really well. Uh, and what it does is it forces you to show, to demonstrate conclusively that your layer is doing or behaving exactly as expected. Mm -hmm. uh, and it raises the bar of quality to such a high degree that eventually your users stop making that assumption. And so I think it's just a matter of maturity in service mesh. It's something that we're pursuing in Istio. I don't think that we're there yet. One of the ways that we're doing that um, is historically, you know, service meshes are distributed systems, but we sort of pretend they aren't. Like, oh, I changed the config. Therefore, my entire service mesh now has changed config. Well, no, you change yeah. the config. In Istio's case, that means it's in Kubernetes, and then it has to propagate into the control plane. Then the control plane has to propagate it out to every data plane, which might be in this cluster, might be in another cluster, a different region. Um, so we're raising the visibility of propagation of changes throughout the service mesh so that mm -hmm. our users can very easily and very visibly tell yes, this component is behaving as expected. I can move on and start troubleshooting other sections of the application. We don't want them spending a lot of brain cycles on that. Yeah, we have uh, we have a little bit of a command that'll do that, that'll actually reach out to the Linkerd proxies and dump their service discovery state for exactly that reason. And you're giving me flashbacks to my uh, Istio multi-cluster uh, experiment where I had to go figure out the how to dump uh, service discovery information from Envoy for sure. Um, I, this, it's super interesting that you went that direction because that like defensive, this is healthy is a big reason why we put check in as a command. It's that defensive like, these are all working things. If you have something not working, it might actually be a bug in us because let's just be honest, we have bugs or it's something that you need to go look at in your own setup. Um, Sabine, uh, tell us a little bit about how console kind of goes about the debugging side of things. Yeah, so um, in that, from that aspect, what we try and do is that uh, you know when something is failing, um, we went the route of having it be seen in our um, console UI, so um, automatically added health checks. Uh, to each of our components. And so when something fails, you'll see it as red in the UI. Uh, and so that I feel like that really helps um, our users just uh, automatically know, okay, this piece is failing. All right, I see it. Uh, it's failing, there's something that I need to do. So yeah. have you hooked up uh, like proactive alerts from that? Uh, this is a thing that I've wanted as a feature for Linkerd forever, and we just haven't had the bandwidth and the cycles to put it in yet. But is it is it not just health checks, but you'll actually can get like an email then as well? Right now, there's not an email uh, uh, feature, but uh, I believe it is something that will probably come in our next iterations. I, I'm sure. Uh, like I said, it's definitely something yeah. that I've wanted <laughs> to do for a long time now. Uh, the, the debugging the mesh is, is perhaps one of the subjects I'm most passionate about. Uh, in Linkerd, we've kind of had to uh, throw the uh, kitchen sink at it, for lack of a better term, and kind of attack it from a multi-level multi-level solution in that uh, we've got a one command called tap that actually lets you do, for lack of a better term, uh, Wireshark on your entire cluster. So you can go and tap and see the live requests. And uh, that's pretty helpful, but it's only really helpful to show when someone's app is misbehaving. If the mesh is actually misbehaving, you run into quite a bit of issues. And so um, the next level down there is the, uh, uh, we've got a debug sidecar and uh, the ephemeral container features in Kubernetes, but I think they landed in 116 and they might be beta in 119, but no one quote me on that. 
uh, allows you to go and add in a sidecar that comes with all the tools to debug it. So we have uh, T Shark, mm -hmm. and we've got all of that like user uh, land tooling that you can go use to figure out the details. Then, um, and it's the just that like containers, I think. Yeah, and it's like a, it's the onion, right? Like as soon as you start to get into the debugging side of things, you start out at that like high level, we know something's wrong, there's an alert, and then you kind of have to pull the like layers of the onion back until you get down to the core problem. Like uh, I, I remember running into an issue on GKE where they had shipped with a kernel that deadlocked when you used the SO original dest uh, socket option. And I'm picking on GKE, it was just a, you know, problem anybody could run into but man talk about peeling the layers back when your node deadlocks because you go and install uh, linkerd it was a unique experience i tell you what um mitch do you have anything around like kind of peeling the layers back on the istio side of things and digging in deeper on the debugging well i'll i'll give a guilty confession and that is that i am a huge fan of tap uh oh awesome I, that was that was a really cool tool to see. I love the way that you guys have pulled that off. Um, I think one of the things that we like to see in Istio, we talked about a little bit what we don't develop and what we intentionally don't. We've seen a great development in the ecosystem of a couple of different tools for debugging your application using a service mesh. Uh, now oh. that the, the network is completely managed, that actually gives you some really cool superpowers if you can assume the network is working properly, if you can go through that, you know, distribution status checks and analyzer checks and everything else to say, my service mesh is working well. Now you can actually do get into your application in really interesting ways. The, the one that I've played with the most has been Squash from the team at Solo. Uh, and other than ephemeral containers, which push your debug tools onto the Kubernetes node, mm -hmm. um, this allows you to run a microservice locally on your desktop and have it connected using Istio into your, your service mesh. So it's participating oh, cool. in the mesh as though it were running in Kubernetes, but you can actually still have it plugged into your IDE, stepping through line by line with local debugging, which is just, it's a superpower that I've wanted for years. Uh, it, it's like, it's the thing, the ugly little secret that no one talks about when you start doing this cloud native thing is that if you're on a cluster, how do you do remote development? And okay, the Java folks have had it forever. Uh, those of us back in the stone ages of uh, Go and uh, languages like that are, are quickly coming up to speed, but it's definitely that like, I, uh, I have a superpower, it's called print. And that's how I do all my debugging. And I know that I should come into the world of IDEs and real debuggers, but I've never been able to get there. Well, you should check out Squash. I think it actually, uh, it can run on top of Linkerd as well, I think. I'd oh, have to look through cool. the docs. I'll, I'll definitely have to go check it out. That's a that's a new one for me. Uh, when you mentioned it, the tool that came to my mind at first was uh, KSniff, which is a kubectl plugin that will go and set up uh, TCP dumps for you, which is really cool as well. Um, Sabine, do you have anything else in the console land to share with us about uh, keeping the mesh up and uh, debugging what's going wrong? Yeah, so um, this is more on if there's kind of a more of a catastrophic uh, failure or <laughs> like never a larger. happened. Yeah, of course not. <laughs> so on that side, um, just if there's so, you know, consoles and interconnected system, uh, something can always break uh, and that can cause different components to not be able to communicate with one another. And so at that juncture, we kind of had we have a choice of um, if that if that goes down, do we want everything to stop working? Uh, and so we definitely did not want that to happen. And so we fail static. Uh, and so basically that means that um, at the time of failure, uh, communication will still occur, but the configuration that ha that was set at the time of failure, uh, that will continue to stay. Uh, but everything, all traffic will continue to be routed um, and so this basically allows like the operator to figure out, okay, what's going wrong, but still everything is still up and running, um, you know, in the sense that traffic is still being, um, you know, uh, communicated, but, um, uh, but, it, but it hasn't all failed and, uh, you know, they can still figure out what's wrong and it gives them that time. 
that's such an important part of designing for failure, especially with a data plane, you're in the way of all of the traffic. And right. if your control plane, you know, starts to make bad decisions, you've got to go and do something. Uh, it's a really, especially interesting, in my opinion, once you start uh, figuring policy into it. Uh, with Linkerd, um, we kind of uh, fail open, basically, to make sure that the requests go no matter what. But, uh, you know, again, once you've got that policy in there, how do you know what connections are valid and not? And how do you start uh, putting all of those pieces together? Um, right. I, I guess we've mostly talked about debugging so far uh, since thank you, Sabine, for getting us onto that, like designing for failure. Uh, Mitch, do you have any like cool stories to tell us about the like trade offs or interesting pieces that uh, Istio has put in to like protect itself from? more global failures? Well, I will say that we have had to rethink what it, what an outage is and what a failure is. Uh, oh. Because we, we share the same failure model that Sabine just talked about, uh, which is fairly common, a, a split between data plane and control planes. Mm -hmm. Your data plane should survive when your control plane is dead. And mm -hmm. so initially, that was considered to be a non-outage. Your control plane is down, but your application traffic is still flowing, so everything should be healthy. Uh, but when you're really talking about a microservices world where new endpoints are being added to services all the time, where endpoints are being marked as unhealthy mm -hmm. relatively frequently, and sometimes that's done by the control plane while other times it's happening in the data plane, it's sort of like the, the good news is you've been driving a car at 200 miles an hour and you didn't hit a brick wall. It's still going, but there's no steering wheel. Um, and so it's sort it. of a... It's still a very important problem for us to look at. And so we've had to reevaluate how we qualify an outage and how we interact with users and customers and say, okay, your traffic is still flowing, but we still, this is still a very serious incident. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh man, that, that's, a, that's a really good way. It's that like, yes, Mr. Customer, I understand you're kind of down, but not really down. Is this a, an, a serious outage or a semi-serious? Like it's one of those where, Yes or no is a much easier question, especially if you've got the checklist together. Uh, it's a, yeah. super cool to think about. For console service mesh, we would love to continue uh, the discussion. If y'all have any questions, feel free to ask us uh, on our discuss forum um, or uh, check out our docs at console.io slash docs. Uh, or we would love if y'all were interested in contributing uh, to our repos. We have the console repo. We have our console uh, on Kubernetes repo and our console uh, Helm repo. Uh, thank you very much. One of the things that we hear from users very frequently who are interested in getting involved in, their, in the Istio community is they don't feel like they have the technical chops that are going to be necessary for all of the details and complexity in developing an Istio feature. Well, in the usability group, one of the key things that we're looking for is insight into user habits and user experience to understand what the process of upgrading Istio is like for a user or troubleshooting Istio is like for a user. So the good news is lack of technical chops for the deepest, darkest corners of Istio is actually a prerequisite to contributing in this area. If you're interested in getting involved in the community, I highly recommend starting with the user experience working group where we would love to hear what you're using Istio for and what your day-to-day -day life and interacting with Istio is like. You can find the links on the slide to join us that we also have a community meeting where we're interested in hearing all sorts of different use cases for Istio. Hope to see you there soon. Oh, that's really great. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you, Mitch and Sabine. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, finally, to call out Linkerd in our community, we'd really love everyone who's interested to come join our community, get started and check things out. I've got uh, GitHub, Slack, and Twitter links up there, and we'd love for you to join us however you can. This is a great community. Thank you, Service Mesh Con, and have a great rest of your day.